Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, everybody, I hope that uh, you can hear me. So good evening, everybody. And I uh, would like to welcome you to our first CEO talks. This is Saida Riyami, an assistant professor of management at the College of Economics and Political Science. And I'm also responsible for the MBA program. Uh, the deanship of this college decided that we should start uh, a, a CEO talk series where we invite CEOs from different industries and different sector to talk to our uh, faculty member as well as our MBA students and undergrad. And the purpose for that is to enhance connectivity with the industry and to expose our students uh, to what goes on uh, on, on these organizations. Uh, today, tonight, actually, I would like to give a special welcome and thanks uh, to our first CEO, who uh, uh, thankfully agreed to spare some of his precious time to talk to us, to talk to our students. Uh, so I would like to welcome Mr. Raul Rostici, uh, who is the managing director of uh, BDO, and with us also, uh, our one of our esteemed, esteemed uh, MBA alumni, Mr. Mohammed Al Mujini, who also the uh, who's a senior executive uh, of health and safety, research and development, and sustainable development, also at Oman Oil and Marketing Company. So welcome you all, and thank you for attending tonight. Uh, without any further ado, I will give the floor to Mr. Mohammed to start uh, uh, the talk tonight. So thank you. Go ahead, Mohammed. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, uh, Raul. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Saeed. Thank you, Dr. Saeed, for that. Actually, this is one of the creative idea to link between the academic and the practical uh, session. Uh, for the first session, I'm delighted to be here as a moderator and with, the, uh, with the Mr. Raul Rastocci, which is it's honor to have him here again. Uh, actually, to introduce him, uh, Mr. Raul is a leader who graduated from uh, Nottingham University in UK as a mining engineer in 1980, a bit young. So uh, <clears throat> he joined Shell International. He has been in different countries, including Syria, Qatar, Brunei. So uh, he was in Oman and as a, the board member representing Shell for BDO. And he joined as an MD for uh, BDO since 2010, where uh, BDO really experienced uh, a big improvement and significant uh, development. So welcome, uh, Mr. Raul, to this uh, CEO talk. It's a good start and uh, to have you. And in behalf of all attendees, we really, really thankful to, for you to be here. And as you know, uh, the theme for that uh, evening is uh, 10 years progress in video. So we need to know about it. Uh, how, how you experienced your leadership in the last 10 years in BDO, and especially with the, this is a dynamic world happening in, in, in this. So uh, welcome again, uh, Mr. Raul, and please, you can uh, just uh, proceed with the progress uh, that happened for the last 10 years. Take your time for that. Thank you, thank you. Assalamu alaikum and wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, thank you, Dr. Saeed. Thank you, Mohammed, for the introduction. I'm very pleased to be able to, to join your first event as um, your first uh, invited CEO. And I hope it's not your last one. So I hope you enjoy the session. But what I'll try and do is, is, is give you a, a quick overview of, of PDO today. And uh, maybe I'll start with briefly myself. Um, 40 years in the industry. Uh, 40 years with Shell, just celebrated in August of this uh, year, seconded and privileged to be seconded to a man for the last 10 years. It's been my longest assignment. 
Ucci Ristucci tells you that there's a strong Italian hint. And um, my father was Italian, my mother was, was English, I was born in England, but I have had the privilege to work more than two weeks, that's sort of my cutoff period, in 67 countries around the world. And so I've had the, the privilege and pleasure to, to see uh, different societies, different cultures, different religions, different ways of working. And I must admit, it's a real privilege to be in this incredible country. Um, so I joined in September 2010, um, after indeed being, spending some time when I was a regional vice president um, on the board with PDO. So I knew PDO a little bit, but it really came into its own when I joined it. And um, just to make sure that you're all on the same page, to give you a few simple dimensions of the company, we're privileged to run the Block 6 concession in the interior of Oman, basically from Fahut all the way down to Marmol, 91,000 square kilometers. We have more than 200 oil and gas fields. We have more than 10,000 wells. We have 40,000 kilometers of flow lines. I have about 9,000 staff in PDO and approximately 65 to 75,000 contractors, depending on the projects, are operating with us day in, day out. That's equivalent to 210, 220 million man hours of work every single year. Even this year with COVID constraints, we've been able to achieve that. And 330 million kilometers of road exposure. So if you add what we drive and what our contractors drive, we go to the moon and back every single day and more. And that's one of the big challenges in terms of managing safety that uh, we're happy to to take you through later if necessary. But uh, incredible dimensions. Um, you think we're an oil and gas company, but actually we're a water company because we produce uh, seven, close to seven million barrels a day of water. So a huge challenge that you pump, you separate, you process, you chemically inhibit, a lot of energy, massive efforts to deal with that. But of course, you know, water could be the gold of the future. So that's also a very exciting proposition. And uh, fields that are at different maturity stages. So we have primary development, which is obviously the natural energy of the fields, um, mostly on natural flow, but a number of them with artificial lift, whether it's gas lift or beam pumps or electrical submersible pumps. We then move to a secondary phase where you inject water or gas to increase the sweep efficiency of the reservoirs and a tertiary phase where you have to change the properties of the oil. So for instance, steam to reduce the viscosity or polymer to improve the sweep or miscible gas in the same way as you put energy into Coca-Cola by injecting CO2 and you energize that tin of Coke. Same process, a bit more complicated. Huge variety from shallow to deep. And it's these beautiful mountains around Muscat and the north of Oman that are the collision of the Indian, European, Sub-Saharan plates that have created some very complex geology, some very exciting but very complex geology. Well, we have deep, shallow wells, sweet, sour oil, um, plastics and carbonates. Um, we have the world's first thermally assisted gas oil drainage project. And we're also going into advanced EOR technologies such as ASP, alkaline surfactant polymer, which in simple terms is like injecting fairy liquid or soap that washes the oil from the rock. And then you inject polymer behind it that sweeps it and then water behind that that brings it to the producers. So on primary production, we produce 10, 12% from a field like Marmol. On secondary production with water injection, we get to about 20%. We then get into the tertiary stage with um, polymer, and that gets us to about 30%. And ASP is now gonna get us into the 40, 42%. And these are huge volumes. It's like finding a new field every time you increase these recoveries. So huge dimensions. Uh, and the strategy for several decades has been very much to be best in class in WRFM, well reservoir facilities management. So making the best of your assets, squeezing those assets as best as you can, as efficiently as possible. 
and world-class top quartile EUR technologies enhance our recovery. Obviously, recognizing that the world around us is changing so quickly. So in, I think in 2012, 2013, we had $140 a barrel. In uh, 2017, 18, uh, 19, we had around $60 a barrel. And uh, in May, June of this year, West Texas Intermediate went negative. And we're currently hovering around $40, $41, $42. So a huge changing environment where we have to make sure that we're continuously improving our business. So a continuous mindset is part of the PDO's DNA. It's always been the case. And I would say that three critical ingredients that differentiate us are firstly, firstly the enormous effort by leadership to engage with the field. This is where the value is created, not in a, in a head office, but in the field. Huge level of engagement, which is more difficult today. So we've gone from uh, field visits to virtual engagements. And to give you a flavor of the extent of the engagements, every month in the current COVID environment, PDO has in excess of 27,000 Skype sessions hundreds, if not thousands of WebEx sessions. And some of those sessions were, are with three, four, five people. Most of them have an average of 100 people attending. And some of the most significant, so I've engaged in the al Hawar uh, dialogue sessions on a roughly monthly basis, sometimes twice a month, with up to 4,500 people uh, watching and engaging and asking questions, and a further 2,500 joining later with, uh, with video recordings or otherwise. So engagement is key. Listening to the organization, understanding the needs, the challenges, the opportunities, not pretending to have all the answers, but certainly understanding the issues and enablers and potential blockers. The second differentiator is a huge effort the company has placed in what we call collaborative work environments. Now, they're very natural today with the virtual engagements that we're having now. But for the last seven or eight years, we've had collaborative work environments in PDO. Think of a wall full of screens where on the other side, we have the operators. So you've got petroleum engineers and engineers in the head office and the operators in the field. And it's as if they're in the same room. They're aligning strategies, they're co-creating opportunities, they're understanding constraints. It's less about work orders and emails. It's all, it's all about collaboratively working together seamlessly. And we've been doing that for quite some time. So in head, head office, we have 19 collaborative working environments where the Fahud team in the head office engages with the Fahud team in the, in the field as if they were in the same room. And that increases the glue the opportunity, the co-creation. And the third lever that has differentiated us has been what we call YTT, yesterday, today, tomorrow, where every single day the teams would get together to discuss how do we do yesterday? Are uh, we all set up for today? And what do we learn from yesterday that we can apply tomorrow? And that's been a constant, constant focus. So those were three key ingredients, but I guess it wasn't, it wasn't enough in this ever-changing world, in this changing oil prices, in this increasing activity. And let me give you a feel. I talked about some statistics before, 220 million man hours, 330 million kilometers. But for instance, we have 201 um, rigs, hoists, and completion and well intervention units. Flash by units, call tubing units, non-corrosive pumps, well test units, hydraulic workovers a massive effort that leads to 30,000 well entries every single year. Well, let me try and give you a flavor of this, what it means. I don't know how many of you, I'm sure many of you have been to Dubai and you've seen the Burj Khalifa. So we drill and put as much steel in the ground and as much cement as the equivalent of two Burj Khalifas every single year. You don't see them, but trust me, they're underground, and that amount of steel and cement is all there. So a huge level of activity and more water, more energy, more power, more chemicals. 
So you've got to take a different approach. And so about 10 years ago, we introduced Lean, Lean Management System into the company. And today, you all know about the Toyotas of this world, uh, the GEs and so forth, but there are not many examples of Jing Shingo companies that have been very successful in lean management, particularly with the scale of operations like PDO. The best in class in the oil and gas industry is ERA, a joint venture between Shell and ExxonMobil in California. They deal with um, heavy oil. They introduced lean when oil prices were $6 a barrel about 30 years ago. They spent the first 15 years trying to learn from uh, um, the likes of Toyota. And now Toyota has their annual engagements in there to learn from them. Everything you touch with lean, everything you touch, every process you review, you can improve the performance between 50 and 80%. Everything. The problem is the theory is straightforward, the application and the replication is the real challenge. So we can all play golf and have a wonderful stroke. And then when we play the game, it's a complete disaster because we fall apart into our habits. Or we can go and play the piano. And then when we engage with different communities, it all, the replication becomes so difficult. And so what tends to happen when lead projects is you start successfully, but gradually fold into all habits and then you re-energize and fold into habits. And so from infancy to maturity to development can take you three, four, five years. And today lean is part of our DNA and we're constantly improving. How do we do yesterday? How do we improve tomorrow? To give you a feel of dimensions, in any one month, the directorates and PDO, uh, planning, uh, strategy, operations, engineering, petroleum engineering, exploration, and so forth, will generate thousands of new ideas and execute successfully six or 700 of them every single month. Today, we have 400 projects. We have dozens and dozens of green belts, dozens of black belts. We have problem solving techniques. We have Kaizen's. And what we have what we call the Gemba. And the Gemba is basically going where the work is taking place. That's the Engaging. Swiss walk. Absolutely. That's the Swiss walk. If you just allow me, Mr. Raul, is uh, we, the, the first thing is when you join video and you you just been in Oman, how, how you look how the bro people progress, you know, since the last year, especially what you just said is, is very unique uh, initiatives you have, very uh, complicated in technical and scientific also. EOR and all this. How you evaluate people in Oman and in video, they progress for the last 10 years. So from the people perspective. So let me try and um, um, kick off with what I think was a, was a very important defining moment for me and my integration to drive performance in PDO. And that was setting up the vision. And that was, I did that in the first two months of um, joining PDO. And uh, simply put, the vision says that we want to be renowned and respected for the excellence of our people and the value we create for Oman and all our stakeholders. So what does that mean? There's three words out of that whole sentence that are critical. Excellence, people, and value. So let me try and take you each one of these. So excellence is what we've been talking about, continuous improvement. Uh, we haven't been talking about the digital space, but the four uh, revolution, how it's putting lean on steroids in terms of changing the way we do work. It's a key requirement for us, irrespective of the environment around us, irrespective of COVID, to continue to deliver. We're one of the key, if not the most significant economic engine of a man, and we know our responsibility. We have to deliver no matter how tough the environment is around us. So pursuing excellence, Raising the bar, continuous improvement is fundamental to our program. The second word was people, people development. So it, it is all about unleashing the best out of each and every employee in PDO and increasingly the contractor community. So it's about lifelong learning, not just getting the best into the company, 
not only providing the best induction programs, not only developing the best leadership and development and technical and commercial programs, that becomes fairly obvious. It's lifelong learning to make sure that all the leaders, as the world changes around us, are fully up to speed with the latest technology. As an MD of PDO, I cannot inspire or drive change in, for instance, robotic process automation or digital twins or advanced analytics or artifi artificial intelligence unless I know what I'm talking about. And so lifelong learning, I'm, 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 I'm studying as much as I did when I joined uh, 40 years ago. And it's, it's, PDO puts an environment that enables that. Secondly, uh, in the vision statement, people are there because we recognize that at the center of everything we do, if they don't perform, if they feel the environment is not inclusive, if they feel they're not energized and inspired, we clearly will not deliver a high performance organization. So in our leadership framework, when we talk about people, we emphasize that high performance can only be achieved through respect, through collaboration, and through engagement. And what we've been trying to do is change the behavior of leadership. Most of us succeed in leadership because we're confident, we're assertive, we can make decisions. Um, we can talk about strategy or operations, but actually the Gemba walk, which is where the value is, is all about empowering people. It's all about listening to people. It's all about enabling them to execute what they think is best. They're at the coal face. They're at the front line. They understand the challenges they face. I can easily say, do this, do that. But it's a lot more powerful to engage with people and say, how could I help you deal with the challenges you face? How could you improve, improve performance from yesterday to tomorrow? Just to make it clear for the participant, Jimba Walk is where the top leaders from BDO go to the field to engage with the field operators, so with engineers, field workers, to gather all in order to have two ways communication. You can elaborate more because Jimba Walk is when I heard the name first, when I was doing my, my intelligence, okay, they said Jimba Walk. So now you are doing, as you just mentioned, you are doing Jimba Walk in a virtual way now with the Skype and where it, so Absolutely. Absolutely. So the way it's basically, it, it's Gemba focuses on people, empowering them, supporting them, enabling them, unleashing them, focus on priorities, what are the critical priorities for the company, and lastly, process. Everything we do is based on a process, well planning process, well drilling process, well engineering process, and so forth. Get those processes efficient and you will deliver greater results. It's as simple as that. It's removing waste. Uh, I, I'll give you a simple example. We issue 14,000 work permits a day to do uh, activities in a safe, planned, material supplied way. It used to take us two hours for every work permit. And why? Because the production supervisor would sign off a permit, then he'd send it to the electrical supervisor. He wasn't there or he couldn't come until tomorrow morning. And then the maintenance supervisor would finally sign it off. So this process on average would take us a couple of hours per work permit. And as I said, we have 14,000 of them. By engaging with the front line, we asked them what were the difficulties? We asked them, why don't you get together at the same time every afternoon to sign them off? Not only do you step change the performance by 80 or 90%, because now we do them in less than four minutes, but the quality of those engagements is much greater because you've got the key participants in the same meeting. So Gemba is all about going to the front line. It could be in the head office, it could be in the field, it could be in finance projects, it could be in electrical projects, in any process that is critical to the company right. and listening to the organization, how are things going? What would you do to improve performance? What can I do to help you based on something that somebody else needs to come and commit to? Yeah, this is, this is really showing a good example because Jimba Walk is to support, to create the lean culture where every project, it should be support from the top management, which is, this is a great example of top management commitment to that project. Plus, you make your people uh, engage where they feel ownership 
and they contribute more. So the good thing about Jimba is to support the lean project, which is the, the great, the great uh, uh, achievement here. You make it from how many to four minutes? The hot work permit. Yeah, so it used to take us more than two hours and we're now between four to six minutes across all our assets. So the value is, is enormous, absolutely. And that was just one process. Of course, each and every one has, has thousands of processes. And so the focus is which of the, the high priority ones, where do we uh, make sure that we can work together in a much more efficient manner and let's remove the waste. What was the drive for Lean? How you came with, that, with the idea of Lean? Well, because our activities were just getting exponential. So if you projected five years from now, Mm -hmm. To do the same level of activities, we would have had to double up staff. And uh, five years later, double up that staff again. And it becomes unsustainable. It, beca it becomes too large to manage. It becomes too inefficient. Um, it becomes too costly. Don't forget, we have to be competitive and get our cost down because that's what the market demands. So Lean is about taking a process and dramatically improving, removing the waste. Now we have digital and Lean together. And the force is enormous. So, for instance, robotic process automation has taken a lean process in closing the accounting books, engaging with the contractor community from a week's work to minutes work. And so ac across all our businesses, we have a step change. But, you know, you, you asked me about people side. So lean is a way of leaders engaging with the front line, sitting there on their hands, and that's one way to stop them talking, because uh, as an Italian, I use my hands a lot. If I said on my hands, I can't talk, which means I'm listening. And you're, I'm asking, uh, and my directors are asking their staff, how are things going? What's, what are the challenges you're facing? How do you think you would solve this? Because if they bring up the suggestion, the idea, and by the way, they deal with these issues every single day of their lives. So they know what the problems are. And you then enable them and say, look, that sounds like a great idea. I'll support you with the things outside your department, but show me two weeks from now or four weeks from now how this is helping you. You raise the pride. All of a sudden, they're really excited two weeks later, four weeks later to show you what they've done. Um, so I'll give you one simple example. At the beach in Min Al Fahal, we have a small chemical lab that has been doing samples for the company for the last 50 years. More than that, 53 years. They sample H2S from the field. They sample the crude quality when we export it. They sample uh, base water and sediments, enormously important samples. But it's quite repetitive. It's quite monotonous. They didn't get the profile. And so when I went to see them, I went to a Gemba walk in an area which I didn't know very much about. I don't know much about all this sampling and testing. The storerooms were pretty shabby. Uh, most of the shelves were corroded. Some of them uh, spare parts were so-so. There wasn't the buzz in the energy. And then you listen to them and you ask him how you could help them. Nine months later, three Gemba walks afterwards, um, the chemistry lab achieved ISO 27,015, which is one of the most complex ISO certifications to receive. And there was a huge buzz. You'd go in the storeroom, everything was cataloged, everything was digitized. You could eat off, off the floor, it was so clean. There was pride. Why? Because we'd listen to them, raise the profile, help them with some of the uh, support they needed and unleash them. And that raises pride and raising pride raises performance. All right. If we come to the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the strategy in uh, people development, uh, starting from joining the company as graduates and the, the, the performance, the development plan you are doing, the performance review, and also uh, till become, and I know you are sponsored different scholars. You have your own scholars. In 2018, you have 161 scholars, a lot of PhD holders. So you have your own research, researcher. Here is uh, how, how, how it just uh, use, you formulate the strategy for people development. Well, it starts with how many do we need, for instance. So you know, every year we recruit about 200 tops. These are technicians, operators for our fields area. Uh, 
um, technical colleges, diploma holders, to about 400 graduates, which are bachelors, masters, and PhDs. A number of them scholared by ourselves, and a number of them just, you know, in the, from the, you know, many applications we receive. So we're privileged to have a, a huge number of uh, students that apply to, to join PDL. Tomorrow morning, tomorrow lunchtime, I'm signing with Dr. Rahma the um, ADAD proposal, which in, is uh, not only an enhancement to the scholarship program, including the community scholarship programs, but also the internship program, which allows students to spend quite a bit of time in PDO to learn some of the soft skills, but more importantly, the application of what they've learned into a real business environment. And that en enhances not only their CV, but actually their um, you know, opportunity to secure jobs in what is a very challenging market. So that's a key ingredient. The second ingredient is that, again, it goes back to the vision. People are at the center of everything we do. So every other week, twice a month, we have an LTT engagement. LTT, let's talk talent. So the directors will present um, you know, middle managers, up and coming um, graduates coming to the company that are performing very, very high, which perhaps we could accelerate their development or put, uh, accelerate their professional accreditation, accelerate the, the, them to become subject matter experts, or perhaps become more generalist into the leadership um, roles. So a lot of focus on performance management, media reviews, annual development plans where the supervisor will engage with the staff and say, look, you know, what would you like to be five years from now? How do we accelerate and you know, ensure that you succeed in this area? Oh, these are your strengths and these are your gaps and this is how we're going to close them. The engagement is a very positive one. Another enabler is our annual people survey that reviews organizational efficiency, working conditions, clarity on communications, clarity on strategy, clarity on people's development. That helps us understand strengths and weaknesses. Okay. How you are as a leader, you are really looking to the result of annual people survey. Oh, it's, it's a key engagement. So we, we just presented it to the board uh, on Thursday. And oh. um, so- we we'll involved also. Yes, it's, it's, for us, it's a, it's a source of pride. It's a key indicator in our scorecard. Not, oh. only do we have, not only do we have safety and expenditure and oil and gas output, we also have people development. We, our total scorecard for the company, our positive or negative feedback from the board is how are we doing in every one of these areas? So how are we doing on the organization? How are we doing on the progression and development of career professionals? How are we doing on how many subject matter experts we have? How are we doing in terms of supporting the community and people development? So it's, it's a key priority. Yeah, we heard also about Dr. Abdullah Lamki Award of Talent Development. Yes, I mean, Dr. Abdullah Lamki was a bit of a legend in PDL, a very, very talented professional individual. And so, when he left, I gave his uh, farewell speech. And uh, as one of the gifts, I uncovered this sort of award, which says, Dr. Abdullah, you won't be forgotten when you leave. Um, every year, we will award this uh, beautiful you know, award to the leader that has coached, mentored, guided, develop as many people as possible. And every year uh, we have about in excess of hundred nominations. We shortlist them to the top 25. I have a lunch with all 25 to thank them for everything they've done. Now it's becoming more virtual, unfortunately, but at least we still engage with them. And then we identify the top three based on the top votes and all the mentees that want to say something about their leader. And this is something very special because it, it focuses all in, uh, leaders in PDO to really focus their success is the success of their people, not themselves. I have two types of managers. Some are managers and some are leaders. Some managers will come to see me and say, what's my next job? What's my ne when is my next promotion? When will I become a director of this or that? And the leaders come to see me and say, 
look what I've done for my people. I had stars and I had folks that were not stars, but they're all growing. They're all working collaboratively. They're all really performing. And if that happens, the leader will be successful and not the other way around. So it's really about unleashing the potential in the company that makes a difference for, you know, success. Yeah, actually that, that uh, initiative, which, which really, uh, you know, encourage all managers, all leaders to just, uh, you know, they have their own success already. Uh, and I think it's so nice view. It's just to keep it uh, to, uh, by the name of Dr. Abdullah Lamki, you deserve it. And we, we heard, in, you know, you are, a, uh, you know, a proactive, such of your product, it's part of your pandemic or what? Maktabi. Maktabi is a, a remote working initiative, which is, I have my neighbor. I, I met him twice a week sometimes. He said, I told, told him, are you in leaf? He said, no, we have Maktabi. Uh, Abu Uday Hatim, he, he, he's working from home sometimes. So we never think about it before COVID-19. So how you evaluate this uh, for, from different the productivity, from the efficiency, from work-life balance. What was the drive for it, and how you you make sure it's effective? Now we we have to do it, but before, and we heard, I heard you were the one who brought it and you pushed it. So can we know our your insight about it? How? Yeah, well, I, let, let me start by saying uh, all of us. Um... Uh, chasing our tails with a huge level of activities, the heavy programs during the day, you come in with ambitions and all of a sudden you're firefighting. So we all need a little bit of time off during the day, maybe once a week. It could be a coffee break. It could be a, a, a session in the evening. You need some what I call white space. It can be 15 minutes. It can be half an hour. I usually do it during lunchtime. I take a sandwich. I go to my whiteboard. And I think about the future, um, things that I'd like to see or things that I'm concerned about or things that are changing in the macro environment. Some days the whiteboard stays white. I'm thinking, but nothing really comes out. And some days I, I never stop stopping writing and more and more ideas come up. But that process allows you to be proactive to think about the future. And you know, a number of years ago, uh, I didn't know anything about the pandemic, but I knew that we needed to work in an increasingly remote, more balanced way of working. We wanted to attract more and more females into PDO. So we increased maternity leave. We provided a lot of support services. But you know, if you take the, the female gender, they're incredibly committed not just to work, but also have a number of responsibilities at home, especially in a COVID environment, they're working much tougher than we are because they're having to plan, to care, they show more em empathy, more compassion, but also look after so many other things. And so to attract more females, we had to enable more freedom in terms of work-life balance. So we launched MACTV project, it was initially 50 people, then 300 people, then we got to 700 people which basically said, look, we don't honestly care where you do the work. We don't care at what time you do the work. There are some times that you have to be together with your team. Um, you know, you can't have somebody at midnight and somebody eight o'clock in the morning or somebody doesn't turn up. So there are clearly some section of the day or the week, perhaps two days a week, where you have to get together. Also for the new graduates to learn, to see the role models. But the other time, all we're interested in is productivity. If you decide to do it in the middle of the night, after dinner, after you've taken the kids to school, or any, it doesn't really matter. It's about having those choices. So when COVID, because of that learning, when COVID happened, we went overnight to remote working seamlessly, seamlessly. It was very, very easy. Yes, a few had a few, uh, broadband issues, others needed some additional laptops, but we went from 700 people to 4,000 people working from home overnight. Um, today, um, what are we, November, so six, seven, maybe eight months into COVID, in head office, I only have 20% of the people. 80% are working from home. 
Some will come in one day a week because they want to get connected. They need that big data. They need a lot of processing. And then they go back and work with their normal laptops from home. Others have a few key meetings, which is easier face to face. But 80% of the organization today are working from home. And PDO are delivering as best as we have ever had. And that's pride, the trust, make is an enormous enabler. Great, great. Yeah, you have a unique things about it because you have been prepared before and that's, that's, that's make it easy for you as many organizations in the world, they struggled, but you have, you have learned it. You already learned from the experience you had with Mactivy. That's, that's a good one. Uh, okay, now if we come to the part of organization development on the chain management, you know, we know something we heard, you know, that's something called NTSP. Yeah. Okay. Which is to make it for participant, new term sustainability program. This is kind of you are developing your agility and order to sustain with all. So can we know the challenge that PDO is facing or the major significant change that PDO is facing with this political and economical uh, changes that happening now? And the creative idea, which is, I know this has come in TSP due to, in response to different changes and the response to different forces. So can, can we have, what's the challenge you, you, you video face and why this, what, what's the content of this, of this program? Indeed, so uh, the NTS, the day after COVID, if I can say it this way, not only did we go um, virtual, but we also kicked off two key programs. One was the COVID committee that works every week engages with the whole organization, not only to address COVID um, mitigation, isolation, quarantine in PDO and a contract the community, but also to help the Ministry of Health. So by way of example, and some of you may not know, but we have produced in PDO 200,000 liters of hand sanitizer. We have issued 6 million locally produced uh, masks, 3 million of which have gone to schools. We have opened and helped the Minister of Health set up a field hospital at the old airport in Sieb. We've spent $18 million for chemical reagents and testing machines and digital uh, machines for the Ministry of Health to help in that area. So that is one committee. And the other one was the Near-Term Sustainability Program Committee, which basically said, the world around us is collapsing. The oil prices are going negative or very, very low. We have, we have a responsibility to deliver to a man strong revenues, continued growth. We have to re-engage, redevelop our whole program because at going from $60 a barrel and in, in uh, I think March, April, May, we were talking about $20, $28 and $30. We had to completely sit back, reset our whole program. And so the near-term sustainability program was about addressing how do we get more competitive prices? How do we change the specifications so that we're more sustainable in oil prices? And how do we manage demand? But the difference is not about asking the contractor to lower the cost of a service. If you do that, they go out of business. And if they go out of business, we go out of business. So it's about sitting down with the contractor and say, look, Let's look at all your cost elements and let's see how we can both survive this very difficult phase. You have a crane. It's costing you thousands and thousands of dollars and you only use it two hours a day in this project. And then we have another crane that we use three hours a day in another project. Why don't we synergize those resources? So you have less cost, we have higher productivity, we both win. Collaborative work together. So that's a, a key element is an enabler. So the NTS program has looked at all our projects and worked collaboratively with our contractor community. And on Thursday, at the end of last week, I went to the board as MD of PDO, presenting a growth plan with a $1 billion reduction in our expenditure. 
We had gone from oil in the sort of 27, 28, $29 a barrel to oil at 22, 23. So a step change in productivity, a step change in our ability to deliver strong revenues for the government, even with low oil prices. And that was what the NTSP was all about. This week, we've engaged and said, let's, talk, let's drop the word NT near term and just call it sustainability program because it's the way of working that we want to continue for many years ahead. That's a great one. By the way, uh, we, we delay this to, the, to, to this time is we need everybody to congratulate you and BDO team. Congratulate your man. We congratulate ourselves for the double win of IDBEC uh, uh, award, which is IDBEC is, is a, a petroleum uh, association in Abu Dhabi, I think. Absolutely. Uh, they are doing a competition award among different things. I've seen the two video when they announce, I feel really, really, I feel, I feel the pride. So uh, by, the, by the way, for everybody, BDO won two awards, one for social contribution and local content project of the year, which is the boosting in-country value ICV through local manufacturing. And the second award is Oil and Gas Inclusion and Diversity Company of the Year, which is called PDO's Diversity and Inclusion DNA Journey. So now we need to know about it, what, how, how this build, how this achievement have been uh, awarded. We know that BDO is, is doing a lot in ICV in, in order to, to, to create jobs, in order to developing SMEs, in order to supporting Oman. And you know, the good thing is, all what we heard is aligned with National 2040 Oman vision. So we need we need your insight and, and, and elaboration on that. We, we really so first, firstly, thank you. We were very honored because Adipeg is one of the major oil and gas institutions of the year. And uh, we secured two major um, recognitions against uh, you know, the oil and gas industry around the world, to be honest. So a, a major source of pride. And I think I just want to bring you back to the vision to be renowned for the excellence of our people and the value we create for Oman and all our stakeholders. So excellence we've talked about, people we've talked about, and now value. So value goes beyond delivery of oil and gas. If we can't do that, pack your bags, go. Yeah. Value is about making sure that the communities all around us succeed. If they don't succeed, we will eventually fail. And so Every company, every country has a local content strategy by American, by British, by local. We developed the ICD concept in country value because it's about nurturing, developing opportunities that are sustainable for the long term. If they're not competitive, they will fail and they'll have to be subsidized. So let's focus on areas that make a lot of uh, opportunity in country value. And the motto we issued about you know, in 2012, 2013, just after the Arab Spring, if you recall, was, you know, we're going to step up the provision of products and services made by Oman, by Omanis. Made in Oman, by Omanis. And so since then, we've uh, launched and created and supported 53 factories. And that was one of the reasons we got the award. Okay. And, and, and for this is uh, the DNI, is it like including contractors or just limited to uh, direct uh, of, it's, uh, of? There's two elements. So most of the program is internal to PDL. It's making sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak out, that there's no harassment, there's no bullying, there's more gender balance, there's inclusiveness in everybody uh, involved in the company. But it also has a major social welfare program for our contracted community. So early, earlier on, we talked about the people survey, which is about working conditions, the strategy, the communication, the leadership, the, uh, the effectiveness in people's roles. We did the same for the contracted community under what we call Project PRISM. Project PRISM basically engages with the community with you know, different angles of, of, of questionnaires that are very basic. Do you get paid on time? 
Do you have a, you know, three square meals a day? Do you have a clean sheet on your bed? Do you have the opportunity for clean toilets? Basic things but that look after the productivity, the efficiency, the safety focus, the ability, uh, the social welfare of our community. And uh, we've run it for the last three or four years. And then we reward the champions and we coach the lesser performing teams. All right. So, so uh, if I just conclude the, the, main, the, the whole initiatives now, starting from Jimba, Lean, uh, the, the, the sustainability program, that's obvious, especially for MBA students who are studying uh, organization behavior now, that top management commitment is the key factor in order to have all these successful initiatives. And also the engagement, where you make people owner, you know, they engage, they can give their uh, you know, feedback. They can, you know, they give, especially the ideas come from the ground is, I, I really believe on it. Other thing is there is really a good response to the change in order uh, to, uh, to, to, to the change that, that the external and internal change is, is there is a good response from, especially for the oil price, which is the saving you have made from the sustainability program is, is uh, I think, uh, all video people deserve a good bonus from the board. Uh, we have almost 93 questions or 100 above question oh from gosh. the participant. We'll try to go through it as, 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 as fast as we can. Then we'll wrap it up everything here. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm at your disposal. I'll try and answer as many as I can. OK. Uh, what's the future of energy in Oman and also about EDO, where it end the EDO, uh, you know. The, so on, on, on EDO, we'll wait for communication formally from uh, senior authorities. So let's, let's wait, it shouldn't take long. So we look forward to that. But on the prospects for PDO in, in terms of oil and gas, they're very exciting because the, you know, our explorers are finding oil and gas at, um, at a dollar, a dollar thirty a barrel, the portfolio is um, very strong. The reserves replacement ratio is very strong. The quality of new incremental finds allows us to reduce the cost of our portfolio. Oil and gas will continue to be needed for many decades to come, but increasingly, we're also putting a lot of emphasis on reducing a greenhouse gas, on reducing fugitive emissions, on reducing continuous uh, flaring to uh, have one of the first companies in the Middle East commit to, to zero with the World Bank. We are working on energy efficiency. We're working on solar and wind and alternative energy. So the future is very exciting. Also because I can't comment on where prices are going. I don't have that crystal ball. But what I do know is that we're increasingly competitive. So whatever oil prices are out there, the company will be able to sustain and perform. As I said before, I'm one of the few CEOs or MDs that have gone to the board with a growth plan in the current challenging environment. Not many MDs and CEOs around the world are doing that at the moment. All right. Here is a question about humanization. I think you covered part of it. Uh, future of EMC, I think they, they are talking about the energy. Okay, what do you say the greatest change you either faced or created in a video? I think we, we, we highlighted the COVID-19, the oil price as well. I don't know if we need to just, uh, there is a lot of ooh, ooh, ooh. I don't know what's this, okay. Uh, how does Raul see the future of hydrocarbon sector in the Sultanate economy? I, 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 I'm, I'm very positive for the industry, um, you know, Let's talk simple numbers. The world before COVID was consume, consuming 100 million barrels a day, roughly. Today, we're not exactly sure, but it's 10 to 15% below that level. We don't know how long COVID will last, but of course the vaccine is a very encouraging development. But let's assume that over the next six to 12 months, we're able to resolve and go back to near normal. The reality is that there's a lot of oil across the world, but a lot of that oil is very costly. PDO's portfolio is very competitive. 
And in any price scenario, whether it's an increase in demand or a fight for market share, we will compete because of our portfolio, because of the quality of our people, because of the lead management systems, because of the digital disruption and the impact it's having in our business. And I think we're well positioned to have a, an exciting future in front of us. But equally, because we can, we are accelerating the transition to new energies. You know, if you look at Russell Hamra, which is the camp next to the head office, yeah. we have solar lighting, solar, solar water heating, gray water recycling, more efficient bricks, efficient thermostats. If you then come into PDO, we have the car park with nine megawatts. You go to the field, we have the, the Nimmer natural wetland, which reduces energy usage by 98% and the carbon footprint by the same amount. We have the Mira, 300 megawatts of solar steam. We have the uh, um, Amin plant, 100 megawatt solar plant. So the skill, scope, scope and opportunity to accelerate the transition to new energies, including hydrogen, is incredibly exciting and uh, PDO are well positioned in that space. All right. Uh, but but we'll, we might highlight the cost of that uh, alternative energy. But but now it's I think you are you are you are just mentioning that because definitely it will not give the ROI now, as 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 that market. Oh, is no, not not at all. I mean, if you look at our um, solar projects, they're incredibly attractive today. They're as attractive in some cases, even more attractive than some of our high cost gas projects. So, you know, we, it's no longer about, well, it, it, it's nice for the environment, but it's costly. It's actually very good for the environment and very competitive and very sustainable. And by the way, it creates loads of jobs. So, I'm, seconding, I'm seconding this because we run seven of our uh, uh, fuel station, service station with the manual marketing with solar, and we are really saving a good money of it. So Absolutely. we are Absolutely. not paying bills now. Uh, we don't want the medic to, to hear that. <laughs> Talal al uh, Dr. Talal is asking, thank you, Raul, how do you look to video supply chain response post-COVID-19? China lockdown, US trouble. Yeah. I think uh, wow, uh, Trump will be quiet. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. somebody struggle with cash flow, video needs to meet their target. Yeah, so if we take the supply chain, it's a great question. Um, the first uh, month of the NTSP committee that met every single day and had a lot of people and the senior managers reviewing performance and challenges every week was all about understanding how we would cope with the supply constraints. You know, we had a significant proportion of our supplies from China, a tangible proportion from Korea, a tangible proportion from Italy, and so forth. And all those supply chains were locking down. So for every item, whether it's well tubulars, well heads, uh, special equipment, we had to look at alternatives. And the company was incredibly efficient and making sure that by the end of this year, and we're nearly there at this stage, none of our projects or well, the vast, vast majority of our projects did not suffer any delays because they made sure if the main supply chain wasn't there, they would find an alternative. It also put even more impetus on the local supply chain. So even that was increased to, to make sure that more and more products were no longer reliant on overseas imports, but domestic uh, production. All right. Actually, as, as the theme of, of that uh, evening event is mainly on people, on organization effectiveness. So I've seen a lot of financial, economical uh, question, whereas it's really you know about the oil price, uh, Mr. Murshid, also we have Musalhi, they are talking about the, 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 the oil price and this. So we, 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 by the time we have 100 questions, so we will, we will really uh, focus on, on the organization effectiveness uh, and the theme uh, of the night uh, question. So uh, what will make you change a company vision? If well, it needs 10 years to come? 
I, I, I think, so let me, so we talked about excellence, we talked about people, we talked about value in that simple sentence. Uh, that vision was set 10 years ago. Um, uh, during my tenure, I can't see the need to change that vision. And obviously when uh, different leaders will take on the role, they will review how they want to go forward. But for me, those three elements, raising the bar, people at the center of everything we do, and value across everything we do beyond oil and gas, have enabled one key organizational effectiveness driver, which I would summarize under the word pride. The people in PDO are incredibly proud of the contribution they make and can make to a man in the local communities. And that drive drives performance, drives creativity, drives inspiration, drives collaboration. And that's why we get uh, awards such as we did recently in Adipec. All right, I've, I've seen uh, almost more, more question. Uh, in renewable energy now, they start to ask about the alternative for renewable energy, which is show the direction where video also investing uh, in that. And uh, Mira is one of that uh, Project, what's the future of it? There is a question, what's the future of Mira? So Mira was, was three phases. Phase one, which was essentially um, the first stage. Phase two, which uh, we recently completed, that got us to 300 megawatts. And then we had a phase three that would bring it to one gigawatt, but it was subject to putting a lot of effort in the storage. There's no point to put an enormous amount of energy that you can only use during the day. To inject that steam, you would need thousands of wells. And then at night, you shut down operations because obviously it, you don't have the, you, you only have, you rely on the sun intermittency and therefore you need storage. And so a lot of effort, a lot of design, a lot of engineering, a lot of um, evaluations with different systems, molten salt um, and, uh, and various other um, technologies, uh, batteries and so forth are being evaluated to understand what would be the enabler. Now, one key ingredient that we're really excited about is that in the south of Oman, near um, Amal and Amin, there's actually quite a lot of wind. And that wind tends to start towards the evening hours. And so you can go from a solar phase to a wind phase and therefore require a lot less storage because there's more continuity in the supply chain. So a lot of work is going into that space. We've got a number of... Um, uh, erected uh, wind measurement uh, monitors across the south and um, we've gone to the board and tabled a number of proposals uh, from in, in terms of concept and hoping that in the coming one or two years you'll hear more and more about them. Okay there is a, a question from one of the doctors here about uh, they are doing in, in SQ they are having good expertise in energy economics so they are asking if there is a possible collaboration between the academics and the College of uh, Economic and Political Science and also PDO. So if there is uh, any window for to have this collaboration, it will help also as the whole, the Sultanate also the 2040 is focusing on alternative energy. It's and, and practically as a company, they are working on it. I know OQ, I know BDO, I know different companies, they are working. So it's good to align also the academic part of it. So there, there will be opportunity and window for, for, for the academics for that. Absolutely, enormous opportunity and probably the best platform that many countries have and it's called EJAT. And we are one of the principal pillars of EJAT together what used to be called the TRC and the Minister of Oil and Gas. We signed the first protocol of essentially trying to align industry with academia. Mm -hmm. Academic professionalism, capability, research opportunities, the tools, the expertise, and business needs, industry challenges. Unfortunately, for many, many decades, yes, we sponsored a few things, we did a few studies, but there was just fairly large misalignment. And through EJAD, we've aligned industry challenges with academic solutions. And so we have a number of projects um, that we're running under EJ alternative energies, water yeah. management, 
uh, waste, uh, you know, energy from waste, all sorts of opportunities that are incredibly exciting. So for those of you that want to know more, please get in touch with EJAD, go on the website and, and join forces because now we have, I can't remember how many operating units, but most of the operators in Oman are signed up. Most of the universities in Oman are signed up and more international institutions are joining forces. They're really excited. We've also started a technology accelerator hub uh, that again, with capital venture firms, phase um, ventures, for instance, one of our key strategic partners to support enabling, unleashing local community entrepreneurial entities that have an idea and that we can help and commercialize. All right. Uh, there is a, a question come. Uh, I think she's female. I think Reem, Reem Al Khalidi, she's asking. Uh, you are you you in video now. You just mentioned you are supporting the the, the female, uh, you know, hiring where where the female is number is getting. I think you have more more than eight hundred. Yeah, we have about, about nine hundred and I think forty or so females. And if you look at the head office, the main office in finance, in planning, in HR, in a number of other services, probably. Uh, more females than males, but we're quite weak in uh, in the fields area, in an operating environment, in a well engineering environment, in an um, operations environment. We want to attract more and more females uh, because they can add so much value and there's so much opportunity and it's a much more inclusive environment. It's a much more creative, it's a much more collaborative environment and also a much more transparent, open, challenging environment the moment you inject females and, and the boys uh, be, become more behaved as well. And to do that, we've launched Project Manazil, which is all about enhancing our facilities, providing the working environment that will make it very attractive for females to also join the operational engineering and field side. And uh, that's underway and uh, we're very excited about it. So we've set targets in operations to have 20% females over the next five years. We're doing the same in the other disciplines and um, so far so good. Okay, uh, here is, is uh, which where we, we reached to the, to the question about the diversity as, as the, 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 the company is multi, multinational, multi-international, you know, diversity is really but diverse. I, I read it's about 90 countries. You have people from 90 countries. Okay, if I'm right, in sustainability report to 2018. So how's the competition? How do you think the diversification in manpower is really creating a culture, uh, a good working environment, competition for better productivity, do you think? Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, there's a natural tendency to think about uh, Asians, Americans, Europeans, Middle Easterners, and so forth. But actually, even within the same community, or someone from uh, the Albatna coast, and someone from uh, Marmol or uh, the Dafar, whatever, huge diversity uh, already in that. And so the question is, diversity is less about you know how many females or how many white and black and brown and this. It's it's more about diversity of thought enabling people to speak out. It doesn't matter if you come from the same village, but many of us think differently. So it's about ensuring that everybody can contribute. And very often, if you're prepared to listen, if you're prepared to understand rather than to try to be understood, it's amazing how much more value you create. And I think that's what we mean by diversity. And of course, inclusiveness is making sure that everybody feels included, that nobody's left out. Uh, whether you're a new joiner, whether you're a new graduate, it's particularly difficult at the moment because think about it, PDO is such a big company. If you've just joined the company from say university, it's not easy with a Skype session. It's not easy with a Zoom session. And so how do we help and coach and make those people feel inclusive from day one so that they can contribute and feel very excited and can't wait to, to, uh, to get out of bed in the morning? Okay, as we have a good quiet number of participants, MBA students here, some of them is job seekers. They deserve to, to just know how their opportunity 
because we knew that uh, video is having a lot of, of development, a lot of training for, for in-job training, a lot of you know, internship program. So if you just, can you give us over, uh, over outlook about it? I think twofold. Uh, firstly, you know, I mentioned we, we take on up to 600 uh, tops and graduates every year. On top of that, we have, uh, you know, 100, 150 scholarships. So that's quite a large establishment every single year. And even with the collapse in oil prices, with everything around us really challenged in this COVID environment, we continue on our growth path because lean and inclusiveness and all the, you know, enablers, the digital is transforming and making us more and more efficient. Um, we have been effectively the University of Oman because a lot of the ministers and the secretaries, CEOs of a lot of companies are ex-PDO. So when people ask me, what is your percentage of organization? Uh, today's number is 88.38%. But actually it's three or 400% because essentially most of the other businesses uh, have professionals ex-PDO. And so that's the, you know, the academic excellence we pride ourselves in. We contribute to the development of society. Um, when we talk about ICV, do you put humanization as a part of criteria for ICV or just the ICV that the money will go for the SME owners is Omani? But no, you... it's, it, humanization is key. So again, the simple strap line objective of ICV is one, sustainable. If it's not competitive, eventually it will fall apart. So sustainability is key. And the other one is products and services made in Oman by Omanis. That's our success criteria. So it, if, if there isn't in a particular product or service a, a local um, competence or a local expert, we will develop him or her. And it may take two years or three years or four years, but we will develop that. It doesn't mean that unless it does 100% Omani normalization, it will not go forward. The, the intent is to create more and more and more local opportunity, more jobs. And in um, way. that's in practical way as well. Uh, I think we, we, we just cover most of the question by now. And for the hot subject we have here, what's the cons, pros and cons, or mainly for COVID-19 as a message from the leader like you? Um, well, it, it's, it, it's affected each and every one of us uh, tremendously. Um, and the longer it's gone, the more challenging from a stress and anxiety, the fear of loss, the economic impact. You know, I go into uh, supermarkets and malls and I can see more of these shops boarded up. Um, a lot of expatriates have gone home, which means economic development obviously is impacted. Um, you know, travel, logistics, restaurants, so many, so many of these businesses are going through an incredibly tough time locally, regionally, and globally. Um, so there's positive and negatives. The positive is the camaraderie and support. And one example is how PDO sat down and looked after its people, but then the next day said, okay, how do we help our contractors? So for instance, in Yubal Kuf, we had seven and a half thousand contractors in a camp. Now we have 1500 because we've isolated them. Eventually in one camp, you know, if you have an infection, it's very difficult to control. So we sat down with our contractors and our CEOs and said, how do we mitigate the risk? How do we help your community? The next day we sat down and said, okay, how do we help the Ministry of Health? What are the issues they're facing? And technology, uh, reagents, sanitizer. You know, sanitizer was a very simple thing. We, uh, you know, I sent an email to the chemistry lab and said, look, guys, the recipe is fairly straightforward. Surely a company like PDO can do it. And this is how the, the best thing about COVID showed. We yeah, I, I'm, witness, I'm witness the support I get from Muslim for that. Exactly. We tested it uh, in, the, in the lab. We then uh, asked for an independent certification from the Ministry of Health and an independent certification from an independent body. Two days. 
We then went to the Chamber of Commerce and asked that, that we could market it, that there would be no objections because we weren't selling it, but it was important that we got their support. They gave us the support over the weekend. So where there's the will, it's amazing what we can deliver. And since then we've delivered 200,000 liters. Every hospital has a big drum outside the hospital from PDO where they use it, these ISA containers to top up their own bottles and, and so forth. We've, we've given more than 3 million masks to schools and we continue to do that. And they're locally made. You know, we're not importing them from China or somewhere else. Okay, so even one of the positive is that you, you're emphasizing that, that proof that your Maktabi also uh, is, is a successful uh, project and initiative. Uh, so if we come to the end, we, we don't want to come to the end. We enjoy the evening talk. And I've, I've just, if you I want to wrap up this is, is the, the experience the, with the knowledge, with the practical way we have it, uh, there is a statement called lifelong learning, which is, this is a good for me, for attendees, for the students. Learning will not stop. I like this word. I write it down. I highlight it with yellow. Uh, unleashing, you are always using unleashing, which is, it is very, very close to the lean where you <laughs> unleash the best of the person. And this is really a, a leader talk where uh, you have a person, everybody has, you know, negative so try to unleash get the purity of him that make him crystal clear uh, also uh, change the behavior of leadership it is it is the you know most of the company is especially with the change especially the middle management they always resistant to the change you know changing the behavior of leadership is one of the key for any new journey Especially, I know, to enrich a culture of safety, to enrich a culture of, of, of lean, which is continuous improvement program, is not easy. So you have, as, as this is a message for all leaders, that you lead this by example. Lean has a fruitful uh, result for minutes. For that example, it's stick because I was doing authorization for work permit. I'm having a safety experience. Uh, leaders engage with the front line. This is where every leader, whoever, even a father, every leader should engage to the front line, show he's there, listen to them, engage them, take the feedback. Uh, LTT, LTT is let's talk. So let's talk talent. Let's talk talent. Let's talk talent. So, so you and also there is uh, one thing that they are having special about it is there is something called either dinner or lunch with the CEO. So this is one of the of the of the door to door uh, open door uh, practice that every employee I I I I know I knew like I have cousins I have a lot of relatives working in video and friends they said if you send the email to Raul he will reply and this is where one of the of the of the of really the the level of leadership where 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 everybody know about it even when I was talking about the people survey, I asking the question, uh, one, of the, one of the cousin, he said, no, no, Raul is very serious about people survey. So good to know that. And from the feedback I get is like, you people is really uh, like you and whatever we have is, it's more of the leadership, uh, engagement of uh, contractors, uh, developing Oman SMEs is, is, is and also at the end of the day, we consider video as an academy of learning, where you said a lot of ministers now and the secretary, <coughs> CEO of different companies, they, they, they graduated from video school. So uh, this is what we covered so far. Uh, we covered the, 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 the people also development. It's a good learning from you in this evening. So please, uh, we need you to just give us advice for the student, for us as a takeaway message from that uh, talk. I guess, um, well, first of all, um, I would say look after yourselves and your loved ones. It's been a long journey and unfortunately that journey will be a bit longer before the vaccine can be distributed across the world. And it's not easy, but look after yourselves and look after your loved ones. Secondly, 
all of you will have colleagues, uh, some of whom are struggling. Some of them are struggling economically. Some of them are struggling uh, because the job is, is proving difficult or because the son and daughter are not well or because they've lost, um, you know, they have relatives who have lost their jobs or economic substance. Engage with them, help them, listen to them. That will help. It's amazing how a, a simple call to one of your colleagues who you think might be in difficulty can make a huge difference. And I think you'll learn that their, your, their respect, your, their admiration, but you'll actually help someone who's perhaps increasingly under stress, mental health or other conditions. And thirdly, there's, it's a very challenging environment. And clearly there will be less job opportunities in the near term, but stay the course, try and get some experience. Try and continue to learn in areas that are quickly evolving. You know, today we're no longer an oil and gas company. We're a software company at the end of the day because all of it is incre increasingly digitalized. So make sure you become comfortable with the four IR industrial revolution ways of working with the technologies. Even if you can't secure an immediate job, try and get an internship. Try and help, try and learn um, in developing with a, an SME or a major company or an, a government entity. Try and understand how you could help and enrich your CV. And if you're determined with as well, there's a way and you will succeed over time. I have no doubt. So I wish you all well. Mohammed, thank you for helping me uh, moderate the session. Um, I can see a whole bunch of lights and numbers on questions, but thank you. You've, you've saved me from interpreting a lot of uh, write-ups. Dr. Said, it was a privilege to join your session. I hope it's not your last one after today's session. And um, I wish you all uh, great success. Uh, keep well, keep safe, and keep washing your hands. Thank you very much.